Wood, concrete, stone, and steel are the four basic food groups of construction. These are the small handful of primary, really elemental, building materials that are used, and today we're looking at stone, which in this case is cut out of a mountain, polished, and then installed in kitchens and bathrooms for countertops. Before a granite or stone countertop can be fabricated, the job's got to be measured with extreme accuracy. And that's what our friend TC is doing right here. TC owns a really high output shop in Arizona. And what he's doing is creating a template of the job, digitally, with this little tool. The traditional way to do this is by creating a wooden template and then taking it back to the shop. But once again, Technology has made a job faster and much more consistent and accurate, as you're going to see. This, the laser, and essentially what the laser is going to do is it takes a, um, two points. And so I'm going to take the laser and I'm going to make a mark right here or a point here, right here. And then I'll do another one down a little bit and it draws the line for the first one to the second one. Okay. So as I go down making points along the wall and the face frames of the cabinets, it'll draw lines between two of them and create a pattern and that huh. gives me all the dimensions of the perimeter of the cabinets and walls. So if the wall was like not true or something, it yeah, would, just it would like account in, for that? Yeah, exactly. So the, the tighter the dots, the more it'll follow the so walls. So if you got like an old remodel, you yeah. might take extra time and like... Yes, exactly. Wow, so cool. any kind of curves too, I just will do half inch dots. Boom, 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 wow. boom. And it'll follow whatever we got. And I can do a whole job and not even touch my tape measure. Although I go back and check everything. Oh, really? Yeah, just in case. So do you ever template anymore? Are there ever jobs where that is superior from no. doing this? Actually, I don't even know how to do it anymore. I can't remember the steps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm like- You do it in your sleep. <laughs> yeah, the old way with the sticks, I, it's, it, well, it actually is harder for us because, so Alvaro's saw is all computerized. Yeah. So if I bring him a stick template, he has no ability to get it into the computer. Sure, he has to something. manually cut everything on the saw. Oh, if wow. If you think about it, it's, whereas this, I can create the DXF file. Yep. And then once it's on my computer and I build the drawing on the CAD program, yep. then I can send it to his and he has a digital template of it. And yeah. then he can input the digital template onto the saw, like the, doing the paths and laying it out long story short it, it he can then do the automated function mm -hmm. of the saw and get it to all cut out by itself mm -hmm. well yeah. and i only have four guys in the shop and that guy's what makes us produce like he's yeah. a, he's it's amazing and that saw i already predict like it took about three employees to do what that, to do what, what the saw did. does wow and we increased our production by like 40%. So how many square feet, do you measure it in square feet like yeah. per week or like what yeah, can you we produce do about, out of that shop? We install, fabricate and install about 500 square feet a week, which was pretty small. There's a lot of shops that do a lot more, but wow. for the amount of guys that I have, we, we do pretty good. So four guys and you like measuring them. Wow. Yeah, I do all the measuring and the customer stuff. And you're installing 500 square, square feet. feet. Square feet. Which 500 is going to be around like seven to eight kitchens. All right, so we're done with this. Virtually every bit of stone countertop fabrication is done in a shop rather than on site. And Alvaro here is the lead craftsman in this shop. He's been doing this for a long time and he leads an incredibly productive team of guys.
This saw is known as a bridge saw due to the fact that it's sitting on this beam that is bridging between these two walls. It's an extremely stable setup that allows for technical and high speed cutting. The speed of the cutting depends on the material that's being cut and just how hard it is. Some of the harder stones out there can take 8 to 10 hours to finish cutting out a single kitchen. If you're interested in the technical aspects of this trade, in the second half of this video we've got a good long chat with TC, the owner of the shop, who explains all of the considerations in choosing between the various stones that are available. Granite, quartz, quartzite, marble, as well as a thorough explanation of the water recycling system at his shop. And interestingly there's a lot more to the water recycling than one might think. installation of these countertops is an entirely different process. Almost a different trade altogether. So we'll save that for another day, although you can see a lot of that sort of thing in episode 125 from our Spec House series. I hope that you enjoy watching these guys work. And you might want to just stick around to hear some of the details about polishing and fabricating stone. Both the stone cut right out of the mountain and the synthetic stone that's known as quartz. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work. That's the granite shop. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll try to get some shots of this stuff getting installed, but it's kind of a whole different day of work than, than the fabrication. So we'll have to catch that next time. And I'm kind of wondering, is it like polishing wood? Are there some stones that can't be polished? Can anything be polished up to a mirror? How does that work? Let's start with the thicknesses of material. You have two yeah. different thicknesses. Yeah. This and uh, on my right hand is going to be three centimeter stone. And I, we use the metric system for describing the stone thickness. I'm not sure why, but I, I think it's just because like it comes from Italy and all, you know, other countries. And that's the way it is. So th three centimeter stone is the thicker material. And then there's two centimeter stone and you can see the thickness differences. Well, in tract homes, they like the thicker stone because all we have to do is polish it. Cut it, polish it, and put it in. It's very effective as far as speed is concerned. Mm. Well, um, and then with the two centimeter, we'll laminate it or add a thicker edge to it. Well, one thing that's cool is when we go to polish this material, it is essentially just like you're saying, like wood. We start with a stone, and there's a, a, a basically a big round stone that we'll put on the end of our grinders. And that will knock down the real hard, rough areas. And then once from there, then you get these pads that go, that, that are like sanding grits. You're going to start with the most aggressive and go to the most fine. And then you go through a series of buffing pads. And all that has to be done on every square inch of the edge or you will not get a good shine. And we have guys specifically in the shop that are just dedicated to polishing all day long. If you hear in the background, you might hear the whine of the pneumatic tools running. Um, they can't use any electrical or anything just because they could get the fear of shock or something like that through electricity. And they're all water fed, so they have all rain suits on and they just water polish all day long. That's that's what they do. And they go through all these grits. Um, one of the things that I did to kind of just like speed up or improve business was uh, I didn't want to hire any more guys, so I decided to go to the, the, the machinery route, and I know you know that. Um, so one of the things was to try to do this mitered edge. I don't know if the camera will pick it up very yeah, good. Yeah, and actually the footage from your shop showed the saw tilting and, and making some of those cuts. Yeah, so what that achieves in one of the things, the routes that I wanted is nobody in, in – at least in Arizona, was really doing a mitered edge at the time. Everybody was doing this butt laminate. I have a – this is just on my desk. I don't know if you can see the way this was laminated. Yeah. Sure. But it's laminated, basically sandwiched, mm -hmm. and then we had to cut the edge off and polish the whole edge, like everything, mm -hmm. top to bottom. Whereas when you do a mitered edge, you got, we cut it. This piece gets folded down. And the face is polished already. You right. just push this top corner. 
and that's it. Like it's done. You go through the steps of polishing, but you just round the top corner, round this bottom corner, and and it's out the door. So the speed is was way better. Okay, so that's kind of like how we polish it. Though we go through the same thing as sanding a piece of wood to getting a high shine or a high finish on on a piece of wood. Same process with granite, but we get to a series of buff pads and those buffing pads start to pull a shine on them on the stone. Um, as so we, can any stone, can any like rock yes, basically be rock, polished? Any rock. Now you will get some material. We'll get into this probably a little bit later where the grades of granite actually are different and there's no quality per se, in my opinion, quality is going to be derived from rarity and the ability to get the material out of the mountain as a piece we can work with. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll explain that a little bit later, but when we're, let's, I'll get this three CM piece back. Let's just say we're polishing this and we are trying to get it smooth. There's going to be chips all along these edges. Some material, when we're polishing, we're using that stone. It will, these chips will get bigger. And, oh. and as they, cause we start to go through the grit, we can't have chips on the edges. So like wood has wood putty. We right. have a, a, a knife grade polyester resin that we will go through. We will mix it in the, uh, a color in the glue to match the color of the stone. And then we will go through and all the low voids we will fill with this resin. And then we keep going with the stone and all those polishing steps to get to our high shine. A lot of people don't know on some of the higher end, really brittle, nasty, I shouldn't say nasty material, but um, rare material that's brittle. A lot of it's glue just because the pieces fall out and it's just kind of part of it. Um, if you wow. leave a piece of granite out in the sun, for a period of a year, they will polish the surface at the factory. And the surface, if there's low voids in the surface, they will fill that with a resin as well. And you don't know when it's fresh from the factory. Um, and when you put it in your house, it doesn't see any sunlight or any kind of UV rays or anything like that. So what will end up happening is if you leave that out in the sun for some time, you will start to see all the resin get exposed in, the sun, mm. in that material. So, and that's why I tell people there is, if somebody's doing an outside barbecue, I always say there's outside granite and there's inside granite. So we got to choose an outside granite where the stone is pure stone. There's no fill or, or resin or anything in the surface. Um, but yeah, back to kind of what I was originally talking about when we do these edges, some, we have few areas and spots where it is a resin that we have to fill. And then we polish the whole thing all said and done. You'll never notice that there's glue in the edges um, oh. just because it, we match a color and the, whoever's doing it should do a good job. If they do a good job, you won't, you won't see any of it. Um, I've it's always used granite bottom. as like a generic term, like granite, but I know a lot of times I'll be talking about some other type of stone. Like you said, marble, I've never done marble, but some <laughs> people will, but there's, I know there's quartz and now we got all these synthetic stones. Yeah. And so will you kind of just shake that out a little bit? Like, Granite so, is a particular type of stone, but I'm guessing there's a lot of others. And what is quartz? And do they all fabricate the same, like for you guys? No, no, they don't. And that's what's really difficult for us. For like, for instance, for like a woodworker, because we're kind of making that comparison. A lot of their materials are roughly the same. They cut the same. They mm -hmm. they build the same. For us, that's one of our biggest challenges. Is every a lot of the material we work, work with is very different and it's super challenging for us and i'll kind of go through them so granite is a, is an igneous rock um and if you know i know a lot of people kind of are understand they understand the life cycle of a rock um and then so igneous rock basically was built uh, in in the ground with a lot of heat and pressure um and it's hardy material well you're gonna get then you get like people have heard of sandstone sandstone rock is kind of at I think it's at the beginning of the rock cycle or life cycle in, and it's a very sand. It's basically compact sand. Um, you get like flagstone, all that kind of stuff. Well, it's brittle. It, it, mm -hmm. it basically like falls apart very easily if we try to do it. Now people use them for steps and all that kind of stuff. Well, the next step from sandstone is going to go into uh, a marble. A marble is, a, is way better than a sandstone 
but it still has a lot of that soft characteristics to it. I always tell my customers if they go with marble, just be prepared to have problems. Like it is going to happen. It's just part of it. Um, you have to go into marble understanding that you're going to have to seal it frequently. You're probably going to have to get the surface refinished. Um, I had a customer one time, his kid left a lemon face down on a marble countertop, polished, shine, nice, beautiful countertop. And that lemon, I would probably say one thirty second of an inch ate down into the stone. Like a crazy, I was, I, when I went there and I saw it, it was just floored me. It doesn't yeah. take acid. Like any kind of acidic um, orange juice, lemons, all that kind of acidic stuff, it just eats it up. A oh, red wow. wine, uh, it, it just tears up marble. So that's where quartz came into view, into production. None of the, I guess... In our industry, there's barely two different industries. You got the granite fabricator industry, and then you're going to have the supplier industry. The supplier industry noticed that marble is a terrible countertop. Beautiful. Like, you can't get any, and beautiful, it is timeless. Think how much, how long Carrera marble has been around. But yeah. for a marble countertop that's being used in the kitchen is not the best idea if you want to keep them super beautiful and shiny. Um, I tell people, if you want an antique look, okay, it's your it's your product. Go for it. You know, but you get that antique look really fast. Um, <laughs> yeah. Marble is a, is, is a sought-after countertop, but it's just not functional in a modern-day kitchen. So they came up with these synthetic slabs, which we call them quartz. Quartz is a natural rock, and they basically have taken that – Quartz rock, which is a very hard rock. A lot of people are familiar with what quartz is. Mm -hmm. They crush it up, and I'm really not 100% on the process on that, how, to, how they make these slabs. But they take rock, and then they take resin, or mm -hmm. a glue, and they combine them, and they make these beautiful white slabs and that, that mimic marble. That's how it started out. Um, you might get somebody to say something different that it started another way, but that's my understanding of how it started yeah. was – to cater to the customers that wanted white with gray veins. Um, yeah. That's marble. So, it, it, and then it just took off. Like the white countertop just absolutely took off. We all know white with gray is just the thing to do right now. And it, it was, it's been insane how, ma how many kitchens we do uh, with synthetic slabs. It's what's better, granite or quartz? And I can't really answer that question very well because. Your pro, your pro, your pro, pros and cons um, analysis might be different than you know mine. So, for instance, like granite, you have to seal frequently. Seal depending on the material, but about I'd say once a year, roughly. Um, some granite is porous, and some granite is really not porous. And so, the porous ones, you just got to seal it, and sealing plugs up the pores, so oil doesn't get in it. Um, bacteria doesn't get in it that you're just taking care of the pores and plugging them up with the sealer if you use a, a heavy uh, cleaners that takes the sealer off um if mm. you know you see where i'm going with that and, and then real porous material this the pores open back up because they're so large you right. just got to go back through uh, you know i tell some customers if their stone is really porous um, you got to seal it once every six months. Just stay on top of it. Yeah. Okay, so the alternate, that's really the main down of the granite. Oh, granite now is super busy. So it's busy. It's got a lot of movement going on. Um, and whereas, whereas quartz is, you could choose from different colors. Uh, you can have plain colors. You have plain white. You can have white with gray vein. You have real like... Um, modern speckles looking uh, materials a lot of hotels use the speckly colors um, you get a lot more it's just honestly two different colors uh, with granite and quartz well the usability or the user part of it with granite you got to seal with quartz you got to protect it from the heat um, heat is going to be the main issue with quartz uh, and one of the things is when you break down the ins and outs of quartz it comes down like high quality quartz is is the content of quartz to uh, the resin or the glue that's in there. High high glue content is a lower quality quartz, and mm -hmm. and the high quartz content is going to be a higher grade quartz. And so that's my understanding of what makes a high end quartz and a low end quartz. 
So even like setting a hot pan on the quartz is that that can break so down that resin a little bit. They, 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 you know, when I say they, who are we talking about? Suppliers, the the quartz industry. Yeah. That's who I reference. Um, now, my personal experience, I've never heard anybody of screwing up the countertops or messing up the countertops from a, a hot pan. Not, not once. Uh, yeah. But I've had, I've had three customers call me and say that they. They were cooking their crock pot, and they heard a loud noise. They went in there, and and under their crock pot was cracked. So three oh. crock pot customers wow. had issues, and it kind of is one of those things. Where it's like, come on, you got to like, yeah. I vigil. I try to be in front of it and tell customers not to use hot stuff. Um, yeah. But crock pots are the only issues that I've had with ports. Wow. That would be very disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> to have that happen. I guess uh, all you gotta do is like put a cookie sheet down first or even a towel, just like give it oh, a little help. Just a little buffer. You really yeah. don't need much, but yeah, it, I think a hot pan is usually like one to most 30 seconds to of heat on that surface. Usually yeah. you get to put it somewhere else. Whereas a crock pot is hours and hours and hours of yeah. heat. And yep. I think that long-term heat is what's not going to do good. Yeah, that makes sense. So, anyways, and it's it causes a pain too. Um, <laughs> a couple of little things with quartz too. The higher grade quartz, I do try to get my customers to spend a little more money on their quartz and buy a higher grade quartz because the lower grade it has a lot of the resin content in it and. It's like I had a customer, their kid wrote Sharpie all over their, their countertop, and we couldn't get it out. Um, and so, yeah, I know. It was rough. Um, there are some tricks that we do to get the uh, to make the countertops look good. Um, Sharpie is a hard thing to get out of it. And I think it's the glue. Um, I don't know if I should call it glue or resin um, yeah. or binder, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think that is porous. Um, they uh -oh. say Quartz is non-porous. That's what they claim. But in my opinion, it is. But on a microscopic scale, it's not like I'm through looking through a microscope <laughs> looking at it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think we've had more problems with the cheaper colors versus yeah. the higher-end colors, which I think makes kind of sense. Yeah, that's, that's the way the world works usually. <laughs> exactly. So in okay. you, in quartz, you do get what you pay for is essentially what I'm saying. What is okay. quartzite? Okay, so yeah, and that's um, th I'm glad you said that because, yeah, that's that's an important one. So just like we were talking, we have like sandstone, you have marble, then you get into granite. There's actually ton, thousands of rocks out there. Um, but for countertop speaking, you predominantly are going to have like soapstone, marble, granite predominantly. Um, uh, and then you're going to get into the last one, which is really popular right now, which is quartzite. Quartzite is is basically, I don't know how to describe it, basically in the hardness scales, like just under a diamond. It, mm. it's, and you guys might get somebody that is going to say, oh, no, I mean, you know, yeah. they'll have to wash some days. But from what I understand, it is it is that hard of a material. So to give you a perspective, our saw will cut up a granite slab in about an hour, one hour, all automated. We program it, the saw, we push go, and the saw will just do it, its work. When we have a quartzite slab, it takes on average six to ten hours to cut one slab. That's Whoa. The, uh, in hardness. That's just hardness. Oh. So people, I had to charge people more for the quartzite by a lot because yeah. it literally just is super time consuming. Oh my, um, my guy is in the shop when they have to do cuts, all that. It is, it is tremendously uh, just a difficult um uh material to work with so that gives wow. you a perspective on the hardness and also our saw will we have to put it on the slowest setting that's why it goes so slow yeah. the so slow setting it has and it still will stop from being the hardness of the material like it'll hit a sensor from from like the, the like hitting <laughs> hard, something going wrong yeah too much pressure <laughs> Yeah. And it shut off. Um, so we have to constantly be sitting there. We'll cut it like one. We cut a slab yesterday. We are, it was cut all day long. Like it just wow. kicked our butt. So if a customer's saying like, oh, quartzite's super expensive, that's why. That's yeah, why yeah. it's super expensive. So that's the material's amazing. expensive. It's just an extremely difficult material to work with. And 
from a user standpoint, a lot of customers don't realize that it's very porous too. So oh. you pour it's it's a good countertop. I will put it in my own home, but you have to stay on top of ceiling quartzite a lot. So Just don't because stain it. a lot of pores, but it's very hard material to work. We cha- we'll go through pretty much one blade per quartzite job, but we can get ma- we can get two jobs out of one blade. But we have to stop the saw and and sharpen the blade. Kind of, we don't. It's called dressing the blade. Yeah. Um, we to keep the diamonds fresh on it. Yeah. Um, to keep going, it, it's just time consuming. Um, we have to do a lot more stuff to keep the quartzite slabs going. So, so is it's here's my last question on it. It's it is a stone in the way granite is. It's not like another. It's not like particles glued together with a binder like quartz. Uh, quartzite quartz. is back to just the world of stone solid. Rock. Yeah, that, exactly. It's in the natural stone family. Okay. So from what I like, I said, for I understand. It's marble, granite, quartzite. Those are, and that's the hardness tier as well. So the higher, oh, okay. oh, the harder the material is. So. Yeah. Turning the page here, tell me about your the water filtration in the shop. There's three parts to the to the water system in our shop. You're gonna start with first the the fresh water tank. Um, that water is gonna go to the saw. And the saw is gonna go down into a drain, and it goes into the second part, which is our, it, it's a big reservoir tank under the ground. It's basically our slurry tank or a sludge tank, okay? So once it gets in there, then it goes to our separator tank and then back to the first part, which is going to be our freshwater tank. So let me kind of, that was pretty quick, I know, but yeah. I'll kind of explain each part of it so there's a little bit better understanding. So um, we'll start, let's start at the saw, okay? Our saw requires a tremendous amount of water. We use the water at the saw blade uh, for uh, several different things. One is going to be to cool the blade. The second is going to be to keep the dust down. Um, all that water just spills over the slab, and it's going to go down onto the ground. And then we also want it to go on the ground for a little second. We want it to be have the sediment, the heavies drop onto the concrete, um, and then the water flow into the into our um, canal, and then it flows into that slurry tank. Now, I would say a good ninety percent of the solids get into that that slurry tank. Um, the rest we try to clean it up around the saw, um, but our system and our tank is actually designed to take those those big sod, it, what would be sawdust, but the slurry. And we're trying to separate it so we can recycle the water. So once the water gets cut or is used for cutting, it goes to the ground, goes into the canal, and then that travels all the way down to our pit. We have a pit at the end of our, our yard, um, and it goes, in it, we, like I said, we call it the slurry tank. And there it settles. Um, we do agitate it a little bit. We don't want it settling too much because then our little pump down there won't be able to pick it up. Um, so it, it, it's a real, like I said, the only best way to describe it is a slurry. Um, that slurry then is pumped into, uh, um, our funnel tank. Um, while it's being pumped into the funnel tank, there is a chemical that we, a polymer that we inject into the water as it, or the slurry as it's going into the funnel tank and it, it gets mixed with the, in the pipe going up when it gets into the funnel tank. At the top, the, it, that's when it be, the separation po- uh, process begins. On a chemical basis, it, the, that polymer or the chemical that we inject, it grabs onto all the super, super heavy um, slurry, and it drags it to the bottom. And then at the top, a- after a minute or two, it, it literally separates, and it spills, the clean water spills off, and it goes down into our freshwater tank. Um wow. Being that the second tank is a funnel tank, those solids start to build up at the bottom. Then it's a concentrated slurry. Um, and, and every, I'd probably say two to three times a day, we will walk over and we will hit a valve and there's a big basket underneath that funnel tank. And we just open up that valve and just peanut butter caliber of sludge comes out of the bottom of the funnel tank and the funnel tanks obviously just like i said like i'm describing it next down at the bottom and then there's about a two inch diameter hole at the, with the valve on it and we just purge that and dump out the solids um, as long as we stay on top of that 
we could continuously run the same water all day long, every day. Um, wow. We do have to add to the system about once a week. Yeah, I'd probably say like 300 gallons to 600 gallons, depending if it's in the summer or winter, um, yep. just because of evaporation. Yep. Uh, but that chemical process is amazing. Like when I was buying the system, I, I didn't think it was going to work as well as it does. And I just every time I like see a freshwater tank and you literally can see right through the water. It's just, it blows my mind. It was just mucky, nasty water at one point, and now it's clear as day. Like yeah. it's a, I can't it's a, imagine like what granite shops, even like 20 years ago or back in the day or whatever, how much mess was just getting like dumped behind the property for and, years. And well, what I understand, yeah, back in the day, a lot of people wouldn't rent to granite shops because it was they were so messy um, and just they used a ton of water, and it just they were they were difficult. Um, trades to work with as far as the landlord's concerned just because of the condition of the water that we got to use. Wow. The is we have a high demand of water um, here. All of our, all our saw uses it. Our other saw uses the water. Um, all of our polishers use it. We have some other tools that use it. So that fresh water tank sends fresh water to every machine that we have. Wow. That is, that is so cool. That is, and it's such a small, like little system off in the corner. Like, you know, it doesn't make a huge impact in like space or anything. You almost wouldn't notice it, but talk about, it's like yeah, the beating heart of the whole, of the it, whole shop. It really is an, an amazing system. I, I've been, it costs quite a, quite a bit. And I, I just, every, every time I go work on it and, and do some maintenance on it, I'm always super impressed with it. Um, yeah. our, our water bill here at the shop, really is just from topping off the system, the water system in our bathrooms. That's all the extra city water that we use. And our water bill is literally about $40 a month. It is hardly anything. And $25 is that just, is just to have a system hooked up to the city. Yeah. It's just the taxes. It's like, it's like a water bill of a small apartment basically. Yeah, that is, exactly. That so, is so cool. And, and like I said, I mean, that thing is using, our saw especially is just using i i wouldn't even know how many gallons a minute it's using but quite a bit so anyways yeah. uh, it's um, that's pretty- that's amazing